Oh, man. So you're saying if I uh, mutate my genes, I can't become one of those X-Men, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> I was really banking on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the next mutation that comes along. <laughs> uh, you, you call those the, the poison pills of Darwin's evolution. They're yeah. damaging but beneficial mutations is sort of how you refer to them. I wonder if you could tell me the difference. You talk about broken genes, degraded genes, mutated genes. Is there a uh -huh. difference between the three there? I don't come and say with a demon, no. with a snake in a tree no. like me. It. it was sent from an apple that was eaten, no. but I went ahead and gave it out of Jesus. Uh. In a lake in a glass where sleeps it gone. So my guest today is Dr. Michael Behe. He's the author of Darwin's Black Box, The Edge of Evolution, and uh, we'll be talking today a lot about uh, Darwin Devolves. He's also a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University, founding senior fellow the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. Uh, and I just really appreciate everything they're doing over at the Discovery Institute. So, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you on. How, how are thanks, things going Clark. for you? Oh, uh, thanks, Clark. It's great to be with you. Things are going great. Um, uh, the book is out there getting some reactions, and you know, things are going well. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about some of those reactions today. So uh, we talked a little before the podcast and I'm just excited to talk about Darwin Devolves. Uh, before we get into that book, I told you before the podcast, I, I'm no scientist and I imagine that there's a lot of people listening that uh, will probably need a little bit of an introduction to the book. Uh, so I thought we might start off with, you know, you are an uh, intelligent design uh, proponent. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, that's correct. I think that uh, the physical evidence of life points strongly to purposeful design. <laughs> so what would be the difference, Mike, between ID theory and that of creationism? What is the, the main differences between the two? Because I think it's important to point out the differences there. Sure. The, the main difference is that I, I think creationism uh, traces back its beliefs to Scripture to revelation, whereas intelligent design uh, bases its arguments on observation of nature, that is, on physical evidence. It's a lot like, I think, the Big Bang Theory. You know, in, mm -hmm. in Genesis, you know, it says God, you know, uh, created the heavens and the earth, and that's fine, that, so that indicates a beginning to the universe, but that's revealed knowledge. It's not based on nature. Well, that's, that's good. That's fine. But with the Big Bang Theory, you say, well, looks like everything's moving away from each other, the galaxies and so on. And so it looks like in the past, everything was all together. And so it looks like the universe has a beginning. So you reach the same conclusion, but you come from different uh, perspectives, different evidence. Okay, yeah, uh, and I know that there are some people out there that that uh, you know uh, they believe that creationism is uh, you know a must-have. If you don't have that, if you don't buy in fully that the universe is only so many years old and it's created in a literal six days, that uh, you've contradicted the Bible. Um, so I don't know how you would respond just off offhand to that assertion uh, to Christians who think that you would be contradicting the Bible if you're a creation if you're an ID theorist or. Well, uh, I would say that's, it's not my job anyway. I'm, I'm not a theologian. You know, there's okay. lots, of people, lots of people who know more about uh, theology, religion, and so on than I do. I certainly am a Christian, or I certainly consider myself to be a Christian. But my studies are in biochemistry. I have my doctorate in biochemistry, not in theology. So I, I stick to what I know best. There you go. Well, uh, so how does the ID, uh, you know, the intelligent design theory, how is it settling in the scientific community? Is it, I, I know you've, you've made some head waves uh, as a controversial figure. So what's the scientific community saying about ID theorists these days? Well, uh, it, it's a problem <laughs> because <laughs> officially it's reviled, you know, the Official science organizations and journals and so on hate it, and they will uh, stomp on it whenever they get the chance. Uh, but So you have to look not at what they say about it, but what arguments they use. Do they explain these 
you know, really uh, complex, sophisticated uh, machines at the foundation of life where they just wave their hands and say, you, you can't say that. Hmm. Turns out that's what they do. Individually, individual scientists uh, can be more open, especially if you're talking, you know, with the door shut, uh, they, you know, because if you say out loud that you think intelligent design has something to it, then you, too, will be in trouble. Uh, but I, I think uh, I, I think it might be making headway. It, it's hard to tell. But it, it's kind of like communism before the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, nobody mm. knew uh, what was the state of things. And for all, all many people predicted it could have gone on hundreds of years. Uh, but the uh, but the evidence and the uh, showed that that was wrong. Evidence shows that Darwinism is wrong. So I'm quite confident in the future. Now. Mike, when you say Darwinism is wrong, um, I, I know that uh, that ID theorists are not necessarily opposed strictly to evolution as a whole. So uh, maybe you're more open to microevolution uh, than macroevolution. So from small adaptive changes driven by natural selection to these massively complex features and systems that are accomplished by the same means, those are two different things. So for the layperson there, Maybe you, you can unpack the difference between microevolution, macroevolution, and uh, you know just where you stand on the difference between the two. Okay, yeah, that's an an excellent point. I was a little loose in my language, but yeah, it's Darwin's theory actually does explain important things. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's uh, what people generally call microevolution, small changes in existing systems. One good example is, you know, the sickle cell mutation. I think most people learn in their high school biology classes about malaria. Malaria is this deadly disease, and uh, humans have been exposed to it for thousands of years, and turns out that mutations have arisen in African populations that give the people a... Uh, a small resistance to malaria. And one of them is uh, the sickle cell mutation. And there's no reason not to think that that arose kind of randomly, uh, that some child was born with this little change in the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin gene in their bodies. The hemoglobin gene consists of about 500 nucleotides, at least that code, that code for hemoglobin, 500 nucleotides, and of those, one, count them one, changed in the hemoglobin mutation. And uh, that gives a little bit of resistance to malaria. Of course, it leads to a lot of problems, too, as most people know, sickle cell disease, uh, but it's medically important. So Darwin's mechanism of random mutation and natural selection can explain some things, but it doesn't explain where the hemoglobin came from in the first place in order to allow this tiny change. So it's kind of like saying that, well, you know, maybe if your car's tires had a slow leak in them, then the lower pressure would allow you to have a better uh, traction on some surface or some something like that, but it doesn't explain the car. That, that might be good in some circumstances, but a slow leak in your tires does not, does not explain where the car came from. Yeah. You know, I think this is good to point out because so many people accept Darwin's theory of evolution. It's taught in school, and it's it's widely accepted by the scientific community. And so people such as myself who are not actively involved in scientific you know, study or discovery, maybe we don't understand everything that's going on behind the scenes there. And I think uh, that, will, that will kind of be a great introduction into your book. We're going to talk some about Darwin Devolves. Uh, so minor changes, microevolution, we, we, we can say that those do happen. Uh, but we're talking, when we're talking about macroevolution, I haven't seen, and I don't know if you've seen, but I haven't seen evidence for macroevolution. So why is that? And we'll, I'm sure this will lead us right into Darwin Devolves a bit, but but why do we not have evidence for macroevolution? Um, and why is that 
you know, virtually non-existent? Well, I, I, it, it gets tricky. You have to ask what, what is evidence for macro evolution? Mm. Uh, and you always have to be very careful uh, asking about uh, evolution in general versus Darwin's theory in particular. Mm. Evolution uh, was an idea well before Darwin. A number of scientists had proposed it, but it was always a teleological process. That is, God was guiding it or some law of nature that was uh, built into nature was guiding things. Darwin's claim to fame is not that he proposed just straight evolution, but he proposed that these fantastic changes could come about with no directing intelligence, with no uh, input whatsoever, completely by random changes and uh, natural selection. So <clears throat> uh, that is the aspect that intelligent design focuses on. It doesn't really care so much about common descent or other <clears throat> other issues. Those you know can be argued separately. But the question is, could these changes be uh, be uh, produced and uh, find their way to these complex, sophisticated mechanisms completely by random processes. And the reason there's no evidence for it is <laughs> because it's, it's a stupid idea. <laughs> it, can't, it can't happen. Uh, back in Darwin's day, uh, to, uh, to, to defend Darwin a little bit, back in Darwin's day, they didn't know nearly as much about biology as we do now. Back Back in the mid 19th century, the cell was thought to be a little piece of jelly. Nobody knew if atoms existed. And so they, Darwin kind of crossed his fingers and hoped that his mechanism would be able to explain that. But uh, now that we know the utter, you know, complexity of biology, or uh, uh, then um, we understand why his mechanism though it could affect life around the edges, it, it has no chance of building something like life. Okay. So you talk in Darwin Duvall's about irreducible complexity as one of the reasons why uh, Darwin's original theory doesn't, doesn't hold water uh, because there are, now that we've learned more about biology, we realize that there are machines, if I, if I can use that language, uh, our molecules work similar to machines in a lot of ways. And if you're missing one little small part of the machine, then the entire operation begins to cease function. So I wonder if you could break, because you, you can explain that a lot better than I just did, but irreducible complexity, what is that and what does that do to Darwin's theory? Okay, well, it's, it, irreducible complexity is a fancy phrase, but it stands for something really simple. It just means that you need a number of pieces in a machine or a system in order for it to work. And if you don't have one of the pieces, then it's broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, uh, when I originally introduced that concept in Darwin, uh, Darwin's Black Box in 1996, I used a mousetrap as an example of it from our everyday lives. If you look at a, a common mechanical mousetrap, it's got a number of parts. It's got a wooden platform, it's got a spring, it's got a holding bar, uh, which keeps the hammer from uh, snapping before the mouse comes along. And if you take away one of the parts, you take away the spring or take away the hammer or lots of anything, it's not that it works half as well, it doesn't work at all. It's broken. So, and if you think about it, the mousetrap is a very simple machine. And that means that more complex machines are going to be irreducibly complex in spades. There will be many more ways to, to break them. The problem with Darwin's theory is that if you're trying to evolve something like a mousetrap by something like random changes in natural selection, you know, you don't have the function of the mousetrap until it's all put together. You start with, say, just the wooden platform, and that's not going to catch mice. You throw mm -hmm. another piece on it, that's not going to do anything. You got to have pretty much the whole thing together before you have a function for natural selection to work on. 
So Darwin's theory uh, has real problems with that. And since I wrote my first book in 1996, the poor old mousetrap has been a target of abuse from the internet community. <laughs> and lots of people have tried to put together a mousetrap by small changes. And in my utterly unbiased opinion, they've, they've failed completely. So if they can't do that with a mouse trap, you know, they're certainly going to not going to do it with, say, uh, bacteria flagella or mitochondria or, you know, uh, any of the uh, machinery uh, of the cell. So, yeah. And the uh, second part is that unknown to Darwin, life is run at its foundation by molecular machines that are much more complex than a mouse trap. So his his theory is in big trouble down there at the foundation of life. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I wonder why you get so much pushback for saying that. I, you know, I don't know if it's uh, just the idea of talking about ourselves as machines. If some people would say, well, uh, you know, we can't talk in that kind of language because they're, they're not machines, they're cells. But But when you look at these cells up close and you start to see how they operate they operate very similar to machines when we're using that language it's it's not because it's a stretch of the imagination to use that language they operate accordingly I mean if one part of the cell isn't functioning it doesn't function and so uh, just like a machine I mean if I input the 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 wrong data into my computer it's not gonna function uh, so I just feel like uh, the, the criticism is missed on you there with, with uh, the language that you're using I think it makes sense yeah, um, well, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk. Uh, yeah. uh, some, no, no, yeah, no. some people do, uh, for uh, theological reasons, like to say that, well, people and even animals aren't machines. They're integrated wholes and things mm -hmm. like that. Well, that that's fine. I, I understand. But uh, parts of people act on the same principles as machinery. Uh, you don't have to go down to the molecular level. You can you can take your arm and say, how can I pull my arm? Suppose I'm lifting a load. That's because my arm is like a lever and my <laughs> muscles act as, you know, pulley or something. And so it's working on mechanical principles. And if you're a scientist, uh, you have to say, well, unless you're a vitalist, then what else would these molecular systems be but machines? Carbon atoms, you know, is they're the same carbon atoms in our body as are found in, say, a lead pencil. Uh, nitrogen, the nitrogen atoms in our body are the same as found in the atmosphere, nitrogen. And, of course, they're put together, and they're put together in very special arrangements. But the arrangements, you can arrange, you can arrange, uh, inorganic material into machinery in our everyday life. There, mm. So there is no principled reason to say that you can't at least treat segments of life strictly according to the uh, same laws, the same concepts as you do with inorganic machinery. Mm. Yeah, well, shifting gears here, uh, we're talking about, we talked to irreducible complexity. Random mutation is also such a... Uh, big part of Darwin's theory, you know, just random mutation over a long am amount of time. Uh, you wrote that the more genes that are degraded for short-term evolutionary adaptation, the fewer of, are available for future adaptation, and the more brittle a species becomes. Could you just unpack that a bit uh, regarding random mutation and how that, uh, I guess, points to Darwin devolves versus Darwin's theory of evolution? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, let me give a little intro for uh, folks who have not, uh, have not yet gone out and bought a copy of Darwin Devolves and, and read it. Uh, one big problem with evaluating Darwin's theory from when he proposed it to now is that he had no idea what caused random variations in organisms. You know, if some bunny rabbit were born white instead of brown, you know, he would just say, oh, natural selection can select this. But he didn't know why the bunny rabbit was a different color. 
And it turns out that mutations, now we know, are changes in molecules and changes in DNA, the DNA sequence that carries the information to build an organism, and changes in the protein molecular machinery that the DNA codes for. And it's only been in the past 20 years or so that science has developed the tools to be able to follow the mutations that give an organism some advantage, like that bunny rabbit, and follow them over time and see what's going on. And that's what you have to do to be able to evaluate Darwin's theory. Now, it turns out that one way you can get a, a rabbit to change its color from brown to white is by breaking the gene that codes for molecules that make brown pigment in the rabbit. You know, the brown color is the result of uh, machinery that's making a uh, molecule that makes the rabbit brown. So if you break that, you no longer have a color and it's white. Well, that's great. It's very interesting. It shows us what's going on. But in terms of Darwin's theory, you know, the random mutation is breaking a gene, not making a gene. And what's more, it's helpful. It's helpful for the organism to have that gene broken, at least in particular circumstances. Say if the rabbit were in snowy country instead of uh, non-snowy country. So that's great, but now you have less genetic information than you did before. Hmm. Well, it turns out that example is, is typical. Now that we have uh, the ability to follow mutations, there's been a lot of work done on it. And it turns out that the large majority of helpful, beneficial changes, mutations, actually break genes or degrade them so that they work less well than they used to. And that's interesting again, but that's not going to build things in the first place. Breaking genes doesn't construct machinery. It, it degrades machinery. And uh, as uh, you started with a quote about uh, if you do this too much, you're going to have problems. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if you break a gene to help in one circumstance, that's great, but now it's gone. And so if another environmental change comes along, say, then you don't have that gene to work with anymore. So maybe you can break another gene and that helps and break another one for another change in circumstances. That's great, but now you're becoming more and more genetically brittle because you're throwing away a lot of your genetic patrimony, and maybe another change in climate or a change in environment comes along, and you no longer have any good options. And so what do you do? The species might go extinct. And as we've probably all heard, 99% of species that have existed on the earth have gone extinct. So that fits very nicely with the idea that we start with a designed uh, a design sort of organism, and over time it can adapt, it can go into different environments, like the white rabbit might go into a snowy environment. But after a while, they become genetically exhausted and they go extinct. Mm. So uh, the basic point of my new book, Darwin Evolves, is that yes, Darwin's mechanism works, but chiefly by degrading organisms instead of making new genes. So that is, I call that devolution rather than evolution. Oh man. So you're saying if I, uh, mutate my genes, I can't become one of those X-Men, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I was really banking on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe the next mutation that comes along. <laughs> uh, you, you call those the, the poison pills of Darwin's evolution. They're yeah. damaging, but beneficial mutations is, sort of how you refer to them. I wonder if you could tell me the difference. You talk about broken genes, degraded genes, mutated genes. Is there a uh -huh. difference between the three there? Yeah. Well, okay. Mutated is a broad category. 
you have a gene and a, a gene for folks uh, who don't usually think about these topics is a stretch of DNA. Everybody knows DNA is the double helix and it's made up of the rungs of the ladder. And the rungs of the ladder are four different chemicals called uh, abbreviated A, C, G, and T. And it's the exact sequence of those that codes information, just like the letters in a book code information. Well, a gene is, you know, some segment of DNA, which contains the information to code for some discrete protein. And a protein is a molecular machine, and it too will be a, uh, a string of amino acids. Uh, and it turns out that that's the basic unit of function of the protein. Well, mutation is any change in that DNA sequence from what it had been. So when a cell divides, the DNA has to be uh, copied and transmitted to the new cell, the daughter cell. And sometimes mistakes happen when the DNA is being copied. And so the exact same sequence is not, not transmitted, but you have a changed sequence. So that's a mutation. A broken gene uh, is one when the change, the mutation causes the gene to no longer be able to uh, code for this protein, the machinery that it originally had uh, coded for. A degraded gene is uh, one that contains a mutation which does allow it to make the protein it used to, but that the protein is a little uh, different from what it was and can't function as well. If you think of, say, a gear, a nice gear that, say, a factory makes, it's nice and circular, has uh, the teeth of it, and a degradatory mutation might be one in which the plane of the gear is, oh, slightly bent, or maybe a couple of the teeth of the gear are missing. It can work after a fashion, but it's not as good as it used to, and it's certainly not an improvement. A broken gene would be one that, you know, breaks, produces a completely useless gear uh, that couldn't work at all. So, yeah, that's that's the vocabulary. That's it, it, There are simple concepts, but you just have to translate them from uh, from the science to the ordinary experience. Okay. Yeah, this may uh may come as a big shock to you, Mike, but I'm I'm not a biochemist actually, so uh, <laughs> I know, you, shocking. Um, you play TV though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did, however, ask some of my friends who are uh I I would say scientists in, in their right, uh, to help me out because I said, Hey, I'm interviewing this guy and uh and as you know, as 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 trained as I am in biochemistry, uh, I might need a little help. Uh, so a few of them sent in some questions, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, pull up some of their questions for you. Uh, so one person asked me, what do you make of Richard Linsky's uh, work that he's done on E. coli? And uh, he's also responded uh, in, in much of a critical way to Darwin Devolve. So uh, so what's, what's going on there, uh, and how do you respond to what Linsky has to say about the book? Okay, uh, well, uh, first of all, for folks who haven't heard about this, Richard Lenski is a microbiologist at Michigan State University, and he's done just uh, the greatest experiment, uh, evolutionary experiment ever done. He's grown bacteria called E. coli in flasks in his laboratory for 30 years, and that doesn't sound too long, but it turns out that bacteria reproduce rapidly, so it turns out to be more than 50,000 generations of, uh, of the bacteria, E. coli, and they're so small that over the course of time, there have been trillions upon trillions of these things, and he did it just to see what sorts of mutations would happen, how they would evolve, and so on. So it was, it's terrific. It was the first large-scale evolution experiment. And as I write in my book, what he found was that the bacteria got better. They would 
reproduce faster and take over the colony. And the uh, final bacteria could reproduce almost twice as fast as the original ones. But using techniques that have only been developed in the past 20 years, he was eventually able to track down on the molecular level what exactly those changes were in the bacteria's DNA that allowed it to grow faster. And it turns out that they were all mutations that break genes or degrade them. The first mutation helped, helped it grow 5% faster than before. And what it did was uh, there is a piece of DNA in E. coli that allows it to make a sugar called ribose. And that mu the mutation blew that apart. It could no longer work. And for some reason, that allowed the bug to grow 5% faster. And a couple others, ones that uh, held the cell, uh, the cell wall so that it was a certain size, it broke it, and so now it could be about 50% fatter than it was. But it broke the gene, but that helped it grow faster. So I, I thought, this is great. This is the best evidence we have of what evolution does, and it devolves genes. And I wrote about that in my book, and Richard Lenski himself was one of a couple authors that reviewed my book for uh, the journal Science, which is the second uh, most prominent journal in yeah. the world. So it, it's it's pretty impressive, and he you know he was really ticked off. Uh, but the interesting thing is that he he only briefly mentioned his own great work. You know, mm -hmm. here's the he's the probably the best guy in the world to review my argument. And he started off by saying, I'm a creationist, that, uh, that I wrote this other book and people have written against that. And he spent one paragraph on his own stuff. And in that paragraph, he essentially said, well, you expect, you would expect bacteria in laboratories to, to degrade their, their DNA. And then he went on to other things. Uh, uh, and first of all, you don't would not necessarily that 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 idea is a completely hindsight judgment, uh, and uh, um, so I guess the long and the short is that I I don't think he had anything of substance to say, mm -hmm. and he he essentially uh, he essentially wrote off his own life's work. Because some some guy came along and interpreted it in a way he didn't like, so he he threw he threw out the window the significance of his own life's work simply because I pointed out this this doesn't look like it's on the way to anything uh, profound. Mm. He subsequently wrote a couple of blog posts on his own blog about. Uh, the book and the review, and I've answered those on my book's website, which is darwindevolves.com. Mm. And the short of it is that he says absolutely nothing. He he does he seems not even to understand the point uh, in many instances. I could get into particulars uh, if you'd like, but uh, but let me just say that I myself judge his response as a uh, stellar confirmation that uh, the ideas in Darwin devolves are at the very least, you know, profound ones that give big problems to Darwinists. Uh, and at the best, you know, that they confirm that, that this is uh, likely to be the case. Yeah. I, you know, I, I see that your, your book, I think a lot of the times it calls head waves because we're, we're interpreting the data so often based on what what we want to be true, uh, and, and I think that's the case for a lot of you know those who hold strictly to Darwin's theory of evolution. It can be really uh, intimidating to reevaluate <laughs> what you've built your career and you know your life on. So, uh, mm -hmm. I would just encourage listeners to uh, to to visit 
you know, his criticism and your criticism and compare the two and see what you come away with. You know, go go to Darwin Devolves and read, you know, read what you've responded to Richard Linsky on, read Linsky's work and, and see what you come away with and uh, and you can make the decision for yourself. But it's, it's hard sometimes for us to put our, our bias, I have biases, so it's hard for me to put my biases aside at times and uh, interpret the data for what it is instead of bringing in my own biases. Uh, you know, I talked to you a little bit before the podcast about another criticism. Um, I, I have a high respect for, for Alvin Plantinga and the work he's done in philosophy. Um, and he wrote a book, uh, Where the Conflict Really Lies, uh, Science, Religion, and Naturalism. Um, and it's been a book I've enjoyed reading. Uh, they brought up some of your arguments in the book. Uh, he quoted uh, Draper, who, who basically, and I'm going to paraphrase uh, Draper's argument, but basically he was making the claim that it's logically impossible for an irreducibly complex system to be built gradually step by step. Uh, so he argues that steps could be provided indirectly uh, in some way uh, if and, th- and then allowing that Darwinian pathway to still work. Uh, what do you make of Draper's criticism of the book? You know, how do you respond to that, um, you know, on your end? Yeah. Well, uh, this this fellow Paul Draper is a philosopher of religion, hmm. and uh, so he's more interested in kind of uh, philosophical ideas and logical arguments and so on. Whereas me, I'm a biochemist, and scientists are more interested in empirical, physical data. What's what's uh, possible, you know, in a physical sense, and and what isn't. Um, so he said that I was, well, I was careful in Darwin's black box to say essentially that, you know, this uh, building an irreducibly complex system is really unlikely, you know, essentially, uh, physically you would not expect it ever to happen. And, um, uh, Paul Draper, along with some other folks said, well, you're saying that you know, there's, it's logically impossible to build something gradually. And I didn't say that, but, mm. but that's how it was interpreted. Let me just tell the audience that you can't ever show that something is logically impossible by scientific evidence. Science goes and investigates the world and you gather evidence and you make a conclusion, but you can never say that Tomorrow, you won't find additional evidence that will overturn your conclusion. That's not something that's unique to intelligent design claims. That's anything. You know, Newtonian physics and Newton's theories were overturned by Einstein. And, and, uh, and uh, throughout the history of science, lots of theories have been overturned that were universally thought to be correct. It used to be thought that the, by the best physicists of the 19th century, it was thought that outer space was filled with ether. Uh, and that turns out not to be true. Nobody believes that these days. So, uh, yeah, uh, the problem for folks like Paul Draper is that, you know, suppose you uh, wanted to make a string of uh, letters that that carried the phrase "me thinks it is like a weasel," uh, mm-hmm. which is a phrase that Richard Daw- from Shakespeare that Richard Dawkins used in in one of his books. I I would say that's well that's irreducibly complex. You can't go through uh, non-functional. You have to go through non-functional intermediates. But somebody like Paul Draper would say, well, suppose by accident you got an M in this position. And then by accident, you got an E next to it. And then by accident, you got a T. Well, yeah, you're pretty lucky. (laughs) But we're talking about different things. He's talking about whether it's absolutely forbidden. And I'm talking about uh, whether it's uh, whether it's reasonable to think that in light of the evidence that we have. Hmm. Yeah. And it seems to me that philosophers, they aim very uh, primarily towards certainty. The, the the goal of a philosopher is to get certainty on something. Um, uh, and so, 
it, it is a, a different field, the philosophy and science. And I believe that the, the, the two fields are definitely intertwined and philosophy is definitely a, a big part of scientific discovery. But sometimes when you're talking about the the evidence in a laboratory, uh, it just it's it's a little more complicated. It's hard to get certainty, if not impossible, to get certainty on, on yeah. the evidence, the physical evidence. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would just encourage people to 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 just kind of uh, compare the two responses there. I, I thought that was interesting, uh, hearing you know Draper's perspective as a philosopher and and planning his perspective as a philosopher. And then comparing it to your response. So I was really interested to get your response on that. I got one more question for you, Mike, and then we'll get you out of here. Uh, this is what someone sent me. They said, uh, ask Mike, you know, where, where does he stand on the theory of common descent uh, mm. these days? So I know that's a hot topic for scientists, and I was just wondering yeah. where, where you stand on that theory these days. Okay, well, I, I'm, I think I'm famous uh, as one of the intelligent design uh, people who – thinks that common descent is correct, is true. And I have colleagues uh, in the Discovery Institute, Steve Meyer, who's written a number of uh, books on the topic, who are very skeptical that common descent is true. And they give a lot of good arguments. Hmm. And I have no replies to their arguments. I, you know, how could you transform this body plan into that body plan? You know, th those are good uh, good questions. Nobody has an answer for them. Not only me, nobody in the scientific community. So they conclude that, in fact, common descent is untrue. I myself say, well, if there is an intelligent designer behind the unfolding of life, then all bets are off because an intelligent mind could direct things in ways that, of course, nature certainly couldn't, but even in ways that we folks that have lesser intellects perhaps wouldn't understand. Hmm. Uh, so I have no answers to their objections, but I base my stance, and, and I should say I'm not philosophically committed to common descent. If it's true, it's true. If it's not, it's not. I just want to know what's what's going on. Um, uh, I base my current stance on the fact that there are similarities between organisms, and if they had been inherited from a common ancestor, uh, then that might explain a lot of the distributions of those characteristics. Uh, beyond that, you know, I don't have any any um, particular uh, preference. Hmm. And let me just say that another strong reason why I, um, why I don't talk much about common descent is that I don't care about it. <laughs> I, I, I think that the most important point is whether there was design or whether life occurred by random processes and, and chance. And I think that's the most basic philosophical and scientific question. And what's more, that question is much more easily addressed with the evidence that we have in front of us than is the question of common descent. Hmm. Because you can tell something was designed just by looking at it. If you saw a mousetrap, Nobody would say that was an accidental arrangement of parts. Mm -hmm. You can tell something is designed by, uh, by when you perceive a purposeful, arra purposeful arrangement of parts, when you see parts have been put together for some identifiable purpose. And we can see that in modern organisms just by looking at them. We can't just look at modern organisms and say, you know, who were their ancestors in the distant past? That requires a whole lot more evidence. So two reasons. <clears throat> uh, I think the question of common descent is, uh, uh, it, 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 you can put it, it's put in a whole new light if you think an intelligent agent was uh, guiding the unfolding of life. And number two, I think the question of common descent 
is a whole lot less important than the question of whether uh, life was purposefully made or was a big accident. Hmm. Wow, good, good way to put it. And for the the theologians out there, you know, just relax. Mike said he's not a theologian. You know, at the beginning, to, you know, if you're getting nervous about your your theology, just take it easy. Mike uh, clarified at the beginning that you know you're you're interested in empirical evidence, and I respect that. And uh, you know, I I love what you guys are doing over at this Discovery Institute. I think you guys are making a lot of head waves and uh, maybe some controversy, and and that's not a bad thing. That's that's what uh, science is about, right? It's about making discoveries, following the truth where it may lead. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, I know that there are atheists and skeptics out there that are willing to accept that maybe we're living in a matrix that, or maybe that there are aliens that brought us here or anything besides intelligent design. But it, it seems to me that you and your colleagues are arguing from evidence that there's an intelligent designer. So it's not it's not a God of the gaps. It's not we're just plugging God in. It's there's evidence that points to design and points to a designer. And there's evidence to believe that this universe has been uh, finely tuned and designed by s- something or someone of intelligence. And uh, that's right. Now, uh, the basic point is that if you see if you go down to the lake and you see a boat with an outboard motor, you know, the outboard motor was designed and if you go in the lab and you see a bacterium with an outboard motor, a flagellum, you know the flagellum was designed too. Uh, so it's a simple point, uh, but uh, unfortunately the scientific community is uh, allergic to mm. design because they want to explain everything themselves with, with their own tools. Uh, but for folks, uh, other folks who don't feel that way, it's obvious that much of life was purposely designed. Yeah. Mike, where can my listeners find you if they're wanting to learn more about Darwin Devolves and, and what you're up to here in the future? Okay, the, the best place to go is uh, the book's website. And the title of the book is Darwin Devolves. And fortunately, the website is called Darwin Devolves. Dot com and it's just one word smushed together, no no space. And also, you can go on the blog of the Discovery Institute because it's called Evolution uh, News, uh, and it's www.env.org, I think. Anyway, but you can, I'm sure you can uh, Google it. Uh, so yeah, you'll find uh, you know my schedule, my responses to critics and and lots of fun stuff well mike it's been an absolute pleasure having you on man thank you so much for carving out some time for us and we really appreciate it yeah it was a fun conversation thanks awesome. very much thank you. <laughs> man I, I appreciate you dude. Uh, I'm I'm like I'm a sport. i pop a willy and moves